The guns were silent at Sharpsburg. On September the 18th, the Federals had not renewed their attack, and that evening, Robert E. Lee ordered the Army of Northern Virginia back across the Potomac. The brigade had suffered a tremendous loss at Sharpsburg. Of the 850 Texans that went into battle, over 550 were either killed, wounded, or captured. By September the 19th, the brigade had arrived at Martinsburg, Virginia and rested there until they moved on to Winchester on the 27th, where they would get resupplied. As the 1st Texas marched along, their clothes in tatters, Colonel Garnett Wolseley, a British observer, commented to Robert E. Lee on the state of their ragged first. But Lee loved the Texas Brigade and replied with his now famous line, Never mind their raggedness. The enemy never sees the backs of my Texans. By mid-December 1862, the Texas Brigade was in their winter quarters. The brigade had anchored the Confederate center at the Battle of Fredericksburg on December the 13th, but they could only watch as the Confederate left turned back wave after wave of Union attacks at Mary's Heights. In November, Lee had reorganized the Army of Northern Virginia. The 18th Georgia was reassigned to Cobb's Georgia Brigade, and the 3rd Arkansas, under the command of Colonel Van Manning, was added. Colonel Jerome Robertson was promoted to Brigadier General and given command of the brigade. So the Texas Brigade now was composed of the 1st Texas Infantry under the command of Philip A. Work, the 4th Texas under the command of John Key, the 5th Texas under the command of Robert Powell, and now the 3rd Arkansas. One of the new soldiers to join from the 3rd Arkansas was Gus Bailey, a musician and the 3rd's bandmaster. He and his wife, Molly, had run a traveling troop before the war, so to provide some entertainment for the troops during the winter, they formed the Hood's Minstrels and entertained not only the soldiers, but John Bill Hood and Robert E. Lee. In early April 1863, James Longstreet decided to send Hood's and Pickett's division on a foraging expedition to southeast Virginia, a small campaign known as the Suffolk Expedition. They spent the month of April collecting corn, bacon, and fodder for their horses, which made the locals none too happy. On April 30th, Longstreet received orders to return to Richmond to be ready to reinforce Jackson at Chancellorsville, but he delayed so long that by the time they were ready to leave, the battle was over. Hood's Texas Brigade was on the march to join the battle, but the battle was already won. So they went back to around Suffolk, Virginia. They are just waiting around and getting restocked, resupplied from Sharpsburg because Sharpsburg really decimated the Texas Brigade pretty bad, so they needed to get more troops. On May the 7th, 1863, Longstreet received orders to move back to Richmond. The Texas Brigade marched through Richmond the next day and continued until they reached their camp on the Rapidan River a week later. The campaign of 1863 is another attempt for Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis to make peace with the North and get recognition from France and England to, for the Confederacy. Also, it was going to relieve Virginia farmers getting their crops in uh, in time and not having federal forces take their crops. On May the 29th, the brigade received orders to cook rations and be prepared to move out. The brigade moved towards Culpeper Courthouse and along the east side of the Blue Ridge Mountains to Snickers Gap. By the 26th of June, the Texas Brigade was once again crossing the Potomac River here at Williamsport, Maryland. Sergeant Val Giles in the 4th Texas decades later said that he had to bathe with 500 men of his Texas Brigade and he swore he, that would never happen again. He made that boasting at a speech in Galveston uh, in the early 1900s. He still remembers a not good experience. Also what happened was they captured a warehouse of whiskey. And so, so, uh, Val Giles said, we made uh, four crossings of states in one day, crossing Virginia, 
Maryland into Pennsylvania and the state of intoxication. Bad manning of the third Arkansas was not very pleased with the soldiers being drunk, and so he would take them and dunk them in the river a few times and have them walk to catch up with the, with, with the brigade. The following morning, on June the 27th, the brigade resumed their march north, the bands playing. Later that afternoon, they entered Chambersburg and set up camp about a mile north of town, where they would stay until the afternoon of the 30th. Also, Robert E. Lee said, I don't want anybody to confiscating uh, any kind of furniture, rape or pillage, um, because Southern soldiers were upset with the way the South was treated all throughout the South. The federal forces were not very friendly to towns and houses and stuff, even before Sherman's March to the Sea. So Robert E. Lee comes out with an order saying, do not touch people's homes or crops or whatever. Well, of course, the Texans said, okay, yeah, well, we won't harm houses or people, but livestock, that's a different game. There's a funny story that George Bernard talks about where a young soldier captures a chicken from a farmer. Well, the chicken escapes and goes into General Hood's tent. And General Hood is taking a nap, and he wakes up and says, what's going on here? And so the, so the soldier says, sir, I got a chicken. Not too long after that, a, a farmer, a farmer comes up to General Hood and the soldier and says, "That's my chicken. I need to get. I need. I, need, I want it back. I need to get paid for it." Well, for some reason, well, I believe the soldier promised General Hood that he would give him the chicken, or some of the chicken for dinner. And so General Hood said, uh, "Sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. The soldier found this chicken. I don't think it was on your farm. And it was. That's a typical Texan for you." On Tuesday, the 30th, the brigade broke camp and headed east following A.P. Hill's advance the previous day down the Chambersburg Pike. But they only marched about five miles before they set up camp just outside of Fayetteville. The following day, July the 1st, the regiment got urgent orders to immediately march towards Gettysburg. One of the most pivotal battles in the Civil War had begun. Val Giles said on the way to Gettysburg that they were very frustrated on the march to Gettysburg. During the night, it was kind of a traffic jam of soldiers. They had to wait like an hour and then march half a mile, wait another 30 minutes, march half a mile. We're in front of the historic Cash Town Inn on the Chambersburg Pike, which looks much like it did back in 1863. This was also A.P. Hill's headquarters during the Battle of Gettysburg. After midnight on the morning of July the 2nd, the Texas Brigade reached Cashtown, where they stacked arms and went to sleep. After only a two-hour rest, they were back on the road again. They saw, they marched past what happened on day one, which was a very bloody affair the first day. You had uh, John Reynolds battling Archer's Brigade. You had New Yorkers involved, and so you, they saw the dead and wounded. They heard the screams from the first day, so they knew they were going to be in a major battle. Meanwhile in Gettysburg, on the afternoon of July the 1st, Longstreet and Lee quarrel over Lee's battle plan. Lee wants to take the offensive immediately and have Longstreet's corps roll up the Union left flank down the Emmitsburg Road. Longstreet, who understands that the technology of the rifled musket barrel has changed the way that battles are fought forever, has proposed a flanking maneuver around Little Round Top, a move towards Washington to find our good defensive position and force the Union to attack them. Lee is quoted as telling Longstreet, I'm going to whip them or they're going to whip me. And the argument was settled. I don't know why Robert E. thought that invading, excuse me, charging on the second day was a good idea because a couple months before at Fredericksburg, Union soldiers were charging on Fredericksburg, and he saw them get massacred. During the Battle of Malvern Hill, General Lee had his troops go up the hill, and they were getting blasted away. Well, James Longstreet said that if Robert E. Lee's blood is up, there's no convincing. When Hood arrived on the morning of the 2nd, the plan of attack was laid out. Longstreet wanted to wait for George Pickett's division to arrive from Chambersburg, and Lee agreed. Longstreet is quoted as saying, I never like to go to battle with one boot off. So the Texas Brigade sent out scouts and waited for Pickett. 
We're at the Texas Monument at the Gettysburg National Battleground, located about where the Texas Brigade's line of battle was. The 3rd Arkansas was just on the other side of Emmitsburg Road, and then there was the 1st, 4th, and 5th Texas Regiments. While waiting for Pickett to arrive, Hood sent out scouts and found out that the Union left flank ended at Little Round Top. He thought it was a much better plan to attack around Little Round Top and roll up the Union left flank than attacking into the Union strength up Emmitsburg Road. General Hood made protest four times to General Longstreet saying, this is bad news. We, we shouldn't be doing this. We can outflank them. We don't have to charge up the hills to get them. Why don't we just go about a half a mile down the road and we can flank the federal soldiers? And Longstreet said, no, we have to follow General Lee's plan. A few minutes later, John Bell Hood cannot believe it. He goes, let me make another protest. This is not a good idea. We shouldn't be charging up these hills. So he goes and takes Private Wilson Barbie. He goes, go up to General Longstreet again and say, we cannot do this charge. This is a bad idea. General Longstreet says, follow General Lee's orders. Even though Longstreet didn't agree with General Lee too, he had to follow his orders, said this is a direct order. So finally, General Hood gets on his horse and goes up to Longstreet and says, this is a bad idea. We shouldn't be doing this. We could outflank him right now. And General Longstreet, for the last time, said, General Hood or Sam, follow General Lee's orders. So General Hood, the first and only time in his military career, writes a formal protest, saying, this is a bad idea. I do not agree with these orders, but he follows it. Hood's test brigade had to wait like 12 hours to go into battle. And I mean, they heard the booms and the screams and the charges and everything. So finally, at around 4.45 in the afternoon of July 2nd, they're ready for battle finally. They're getting in line and they're becoming targets of Smith's New York artillery battery and blasting through the 4th Texas. George Bernard, the flag bearer from the 1st Texas with the Lone Star battle flag, got upset because one of the cannons that was fired from Smith's New York battery hits a couple of soldiers of the 4th Texas and decapitates one. So George was upset. He unfurled the Texas flag out of the oilskin cloth. And Sam Burroughs of the 1st Texas said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm going to take the 1st Texas flag and ram it down a cannon's throat. I don't think he was that proper in saying that. I think he cussed a little bit. But uh, he swore that he would shove the 1st Texas flag down a federal cannon's throat. And so they unfurled the flag. And you had the 3rd Arkansas, 1st, 4th, and 5th Texas lined up. They're supposed to go together. Well, during a mass charge, when you have cannons and sharpshooters firing at you, things get confusing. Also, General Hood is on his horse. He says, my brave Texans go and get the heights, capture the heights. As soon as he says that, there's a cannon burst about 20 feet from him, and shrapnel almost rips off his left arm, almost rip, rip, rips it right off. He never was able to use that arm again very effectively again. Philip Work, the commanding officer of the 1st Texas, was right next to General Hood and saw General Hood stagger in the saddle and fall off his horse. So Colonel Work and a couple of other soldiers cap, uh, caught him before he hit the ground, and now General Hood's taken to the hospital. Well, that makes Evander Law of the Alabama Brigade now leading the Texas regiments and brigades, and he also has his own brigade, Law's Alabama Brigade. We're standing in front of the Bushman Farm at the Gettysburg Battlefield. The Texas Monument's only about 200 yards in front of us, and you can see Big Round Top behind us. While a spot where Hood was wounded isn't marked, it's believed to be in the general area of the Bushman Farm. With Hood out of action, Evan Law is now in charge of the division. But from this point forward, the battle is really run by the brigade and regimental commanders. They make their charge, and they're all supposed to go together. Well, because of cannon fire and sharpshooting, the 3rd Arkansas and 1st Texas kind of breaks away. And now you have the 1st Texas in the triangular field. And this is Color Sergeant George Bernard's act of bravery 
uh, later on, over 100 years later, gets him the Sons of Confederate Veterans Confederate Medal of Honor. They asked George about what happened at Gettysburg. Because George always told humorous tales, but the more serious tales he never told. He was a very humble man. He didn't like to brag on himself. He said, self-praise is no praise. So he kind of didn't talk about Gettysburg. So finally, they asked him in 1900, can you please write down what happened at Gettysburg? So he does. Is that a Hood's Texas Brigade Association reunion? So he gets his letter published. More or less what George said is that he didn't do anything spectacular. He took the first Texas flag and tried to hide behind some boulders. Well, when he gets to the boulders, there's some flag bearers from Benning's Georgia Brigade because he had Benning's Georgians right behind the Texas Brigade. So when George Bernard goes behind a boulder, he's crowded out by some Georgia Brigade flag bearers. So he jumps on a rock and he starts waving the flag. Well, from what Sergeant Malachi Reeves of the 1st Texas is right there says that when George started waving his flag, the federal forces went crazy and started shooting at him. Well, George was not hit yet. And so finally, these federal soldiers, according to Sergeant Reeves, says, don't fire on this man, he's too brave. As soon as they say that, a cannon blast, either from Smith's New York battery or a battery from the Peach Orchard, hits its mark. I don't know if they were trying to blast George Bernard off the rock or not, but he's blasted off the rock. And he is knocked unconscious on the ground for about five minutes. And some of the soldiers of the 1st Texas under fire even go up to George Bernard and kick him and say, George, are you alive or dead? And they're saying, I think he's dead. Well, he wasn't dead. He woke up and he was mangled on the left side. He lost permanent sight of the left eye. He is just bloody and bruised. But he wakes up and he finds his flag staff broken too. And he said he, he got mad. Sergeant Reeves said that he's ready to take on the whole Yankee army by himself, so they drag him off the, the field. But what they didn't, what George Bernard did not talk about was how he saved a lot of lives because in the wheat field, which is right next to Little Round Top and Rose Woods where they were fighting, uh, there was a lot of smoke. And the soldiers from Georgia and other regiments were firing at the Texas Brigade. They didn't know who, they thought it was a bunch of Yankees. Well, George Bernard ran over there right at the edge of Rosewoods in the wheat fields and waves his flag and says, don't shoot us, it's us Texans. So they stop him. George never talks about his conduct in battle. He said it was no big deal, but it was a big deal. And, and he was well known throughout North and South for his brave actions. We're in the triangular field, and it would have been a rock like this one, maybe even this one, that George Bernard hid behind with the Georgians and then got on top of and waved the first Texas flag. In the heart of the chaos at Gettysburg, Color Sergeant George A. Bernard stood tall, unwavering. With valor that echoed through time, he brandished the Lone Star, a symbol of Texan resilience. Amidst the triangular field, Bernard's spirit embodied the indomitable Texan spirit. His legacy etched in history, an emblem of courage that still inspires today. Now the first Texas is going up the triangular field and they're facing the 124th New York led by Colonel Augustus Van Horn Ellis. The colorful figure Van Horn Ellis before the Civil War was a 49er in California digging for gold. Then the King of Hawaii asked him if he could be the Admiral for the Hawaiian Navy. So Colonel Ellis sails to Hawaii, finds out there's no Navy at all, so he goes back. During the Civil War, he breaks out. He becomes Colonel of the 124th New York. And they're the ones that are facing the 1st Texas at the Triangular Field. The 1st Texas and the 124th New York are in a classic shootout, just tearing each other up. Major James Cromwell, the executive officer of the 124th New York, asked Colonel Ellis, let me charge against these soldiers coming up. Colonel Ellis refuses a couple of times. Finally, Major Cromwell is given permission to charge the Texans, and he does quite effectively. Well, unfortunately, James Cromwell is shot and killed. Colonel Ellis sees him fall down from getting shot. He goes, my God, men, save your major, save him, save him. And so they get his body. And they're asking Colonel Ellis, or somebody asked him, 
Why are you right here on the front lines on your horse? He goes, the men must see us today. Well, a few minutes later, Van Hornelis is shot between the eyes and killed. And so you have the first Texas going up against the 124th New York. You're going up against soldiers from Pennsylvania. And you also have soldiers from New Jersey and Indiana in the same area, which is firing each other. The first Texas is giving as well as they're taking, but they're starting to lose men. Well, Benning's Georgians are their backup. And so the Georgians are with the first Texas going up against the Union forces at the Devil Den and the Triangular Field. Well, the 124th New York and the other regiments are collapsing quickly because they're getting fired from straight ahead. And then you had the 47th Alabama flanking on the right side and they're firing at the 124th. So that's a no-win situation. So the Union forces retreat and that's how Hood's Texans and the Georgians are able to capture the Devil's Den. A couple hundred yards away, you have the 4th and 5th Texas going up Little Round Top, and they make three or four charges, and they almost make it, almost every time make it. Well, during one of the charges up Little Round Top, the commanding officer of the 5th Texas, Colonel Robert Powell, is almost at the summit. He doesn't make it, but he's shot in the groin, in the bowels, and they think he was killed. Well, he's leaning up against a rock, and there is a rumor there is a story and i can believe it colonel joshua lawrence chamberlain of the 20th maine after they get done with little round top sees colonel powell says sir are you injured and colonel powell says yes quite grievously so colonel chamberlain gets his personal ambulance tells the soldier take this gallant colonel to the nearest hospital but that's just maybe it's a tall tale maybe it's not but some i like to believe what is stated is that Union, Union troops thought they captured General Longstreet because everybody has a beard. Colonel Powell has a beard. He looks like General Longstreet. And so they thought, my God, we captured General Longstreet. They didn't. But it took about a week of convincing that he wasn't James Longstreet. So the 5th Texas is charging. The 4th Texas is charging. Finally, they lose enough men where Major Jefferson Rogers of the 5th Texas is in charge of the reg of pretty much the 4th and 5th Texas and the Alabamians are in charge of Little Round Top. He has to retreat. He says, we're done. We're losing too much men. So they retreat down the hill. They don't leave the area, but they don't take the hill, but they're down there below. Well, that night was a night nobody will ever forget, July 2nd. You have a lot of sniper action. There's a sniper up in a big tree picking off soldiers from the 1st Texas. Finally, some, one of the soldiers figures out that as soon as he fires from a tree, he gets back into protection because there's smoke, and then the sniper gets back to where nobody could see him. Well, somebody figured out how to get him, so he was shot down. Val Giles said that it was a night that nobody will forget. He said it was the closest to Indian fighting that he ever saw. Somebody called it the Devil's Carnival. Um, now, the morning of July 3rd, you had Sergeant Giles said that they're still behind boulders. You're still getting shot at, getting sniped on, and vice versa. Well, <clears throat> a colored servant, John Price, who is a slave of one of the officers of the of the Fourth Texas, gets some food, and during and dodging bullets and everything, he gives soldiers bread and boiled beef, and nobody will forget that. He's considered a after the war, he's considered a member of Hood's Brigade because he was a brave man. And Val Giles said it's amazing because after he gave all the food out, he goes behind a boulder and falls asleep, which was very remarkable. I don't think I could ever fall asleep. So you had that going on. Well, not too far from there, the 1st Texas and some Georgia regiments are at one part of the field. And the 1st Vermont Cavalry is charging them. Elon Farnsworth, who was just promoted to Brigadier General, is charged with the task of trying to get these regiments away. General Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick orders him, I want you to make an attack with your regiments, with the brigade, and I want you to get those Confederate Rebs out of there. Elon Farnsworth knows it's a suicide charge. 
He says, if we do this, it's suicide. Colonel, excuse me, General Kilpatrick says, well, are you chicken? And that really ticks off Elon Sponsor. He goes, no, we're not chicken. And so <clears throat> they get on the horses and you had the Vermont cavalry soldiers make a brave charge against the 1st Texas and another regiment from Georgia. And they're massacred, they're slaughtered. General Farnsworth has shot off his bat, uh, shot off his saddle, and they're saying, "Surrender, surrender! You, we got you. There's, you're not going anywhere." Well, rather to surrender, according to there's some controversy about this. According to more than a few soldiers from the First Texas, Farnsworth takes his pistol, aims it at his chest, fires, and kills himself. The official record says he died from his wounds; that he didn't kill himself. So that's controversy. I think, I think he killed himself. And so that's what happened on July 2nd and 3rd. They retreat. Um, Benjamin Carter, who was one of the officers of the 4th Texas, Lieutenant Colonel, the one that saved Mark Kern, that honored Mark Kearns from 2nd Manassas by bringing him in his coat. He's mortally wounded. He's taken on an ambulance. He's captured at the retreat. He is taken to, I believe, the Lutheran Seminary or a house not far away from the battle. And he is tended on by the mother of Mark Kearns. And he dies about two and a half weeks later. The sun is setting on Gettysburg, a battleground stained with the valor and sacrifice of the Texas Brigade. Amidst the echoes of the now silent cannons, the brigade, weary yet resolute, retreats, leaving behind the hallowed grounds they fought for. Their valor echoes through history, a testament to the bravery in the face of adversity. They are headed back to Virginia. For Hood's Texas Brigade, the retreat from Gettysburg began on July 4th of 1863. Over the next several days, they traipsed toward the Potomac River, along with the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia. It's a very miserable retreat. It had rained heavily on July 4th. It would rain several more times. Uh, the roads were very muddy. Uh, the troops were exhausted. Remember, they had been on the move since July 1st. They had been fighting, you know, all through July 2nd, part of July 3rd. Uh, the men were in pretty rough shape. Their uniforms were in rough shape. Their shoes were in rough shape. They had gotten very little in the way of food, uh, no meat rations whatsoever, very little uh, bread, uh, so, and, and no time to stop and cook anything. So they were, uh, you know, sort of eating on, on the march, uh, as it were. Uh, they reached the Potomac and uh, discovered that it had been uh, flooded. Val Giles, who was now a fourth sergeant in Company B of the 4th Texas, wrote in his book Rags and Hope that it was raining and that there was a tremendous lightning storm as they approached and crossed the Potomac River on July the 14th. The great northern invasion was over and the Texas Brigade would never again cross the Potomac. Uh, and then they moved down the Valley Turnpike uh, to Bunker Hill and Darksville. So Ewell's Corps stopped at Darksville about five miles north of Bunker Hill uh, where Hill's Corps and Longstreet's Corps uh, went into camp. Uh, the troops would stay there uh, for several days, uh, resting, uh, refitting, uh, a pause that would allow the 4,000 federal prisoners and the 20,000 head of sheep and the 23,000 you know, uh, cattle that they had brought in uh, to Virginia from Pennsylvania to get down the valley and out of the way of the army. Uh, the uh, Confederate army began to move through Chester's Gap uh, on the uh, 22nd of July. Uh, Hood's Brigade, for a brief time, uh, went into Manassas Gap on that day uh, to relieve the troops who had fought there the previous day on July 21st. Uh, and while they were in that, uh, that position, uh, one of their officers, Captain John Woodward of the 1st Texas, uh, was struck in the hip by a long-range sniper round. Uh, and that turned out to be a mortal wound. So they saw no combat here, but they lost a very good officer. Uh, the Confederates under Longstreet began to move through Manassas Gap uh, in force on the 22nd after they knocked some Federal cavalry out of the way. Uh, they would be through the Gap by the 23rd, and by the 24th, they would be back in Culpeper County around Culpeper Courthouse. 
They'd stay there for about a week, then they would cross the Rapidan River, the Texas Brigade would go back to its old haunts around Raccoon Ford, and would basically be in that position until the middle of September, uh, when the decision was made uh, to forego a counteroffensive against Meade, which Robert E. Lee was advocating in favor of sending part of Longstreet's division, Hood's, uh, Longstreet's Corps, Hood's division with the Texas Brigade uh, to Georgia to reinforce Bragg in an attempt to recapture uh, Ch Chattanooga. What's fascinating to me about Chickamauga is Davis seems to agree that this is an all or nothing gamble. Now, Robert E. Lee is arguing with him. He does not want to detach any troops. He certainly doesn't want to go west himself, which is something Davis suggests. Instead, Davis will have to settle for giving Braxton Bragg the largest concentration of Confederate troops from different theaters, departments, divisions that was ever accomplished during the war. There'll be troops coming from Mississippi. There'll be troops coming from South Carolina. Of course, we know there'll be the most of Longstreet's, James Longstreet's first corps from Virginia. And that, of course, includes Hood's Texas Brigade. So at Chickamauga, Bragg has an amazing assembly of Confederate forces brought to him on those railroads that are so vital. With the decision made to send Hood's and McClaw's divisions to Georgia, the Texas Brigade broke camp and marched to Richmond on September 9th and 10th to board trains for the journey south. There they met General Hood, who was recovering from the wound he received at Gettysburg. Hood was determined to rejoin his Texans, so after he bade farewell to the young lady he was courting, he and his horse, Jeff Davis, boarded a train for the journey south. Hood's Texas Brigade did not all show up at once. They actually showed up a day at a time. And the main action occurred with the Texas Brigade on September 19th and 20th. We're here at the Chickamauga National Battleground at one of the three tablets that marked the positions of Robertson's Texas Brigade during the battle. The Vineyard Road is just to our right. Beyond that, the Vineyard East Field. You can see Lafayette Road in the distance behind us. It was here that the Texas Brigade, with about 1,300 men, anchored the left of the Confederate line on the afternoon of September the 19th, 1863. The 3rd Arkansas, commanded by Colonel Van Manning, was on the left, then the 1st Texas, the 4th Texas, and the 5th Texas, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel J.P. Bain, was on the right. The fighting on September the 19th began on the Confederate right flank, that's the north side of the line, and moved south. At about 3 p.m., General Hood ordered Bushrod Johnson to advance to push back Colonel Hans Haig's brigade's attack. About an hour later, after intense fighting, Hood ordered Robertson and Law to move their brigades up. The brigade attacked to the southwest, the 3rd Arkansas and the 1st Texas moving into the Vineyard East Field, while the 4th and 5th Texas attacked through thick brush. Val Giles observed, the underbrush and vines were so thick and interwoven that it was almost impossible to get through, and of course our lines were broken and irregular. He went on to say, Our advance through the deep tangled jungle was slow. We could see nothing as we groped our way through the wilderness. The 3rd Arkansas and the 1st Texas continued to advance into the vineyard field east under withering artillery fire, while a 4th and 5th attacked across Lafayette Road just over there into the vineyard field west just behind us and routed Colonel Hans Haig's 3rd Brigade. The Texas Brigade really did a good job um, fighting. But one thing about, uh, they noted that the, that the Union soldiers in the Western Theater fought a lot braver and a lot tougher than the, than the Army of the Potomac. A lot of the soldiers from the Hood's Texas Brigade said that the Union soldiers in the Western Theater knew what they were all about, that they were frontiersmen. And they would, did not just run, they would slug it out with them up to the last man and it showed. And there was a grudging respect for those Union troops in the Western the Army of the Cumberland. And they said, these men know what they're doing. They were very lethal and they were very tough. And that really was a good observation of an enemy. And they didn't just say that about any, anybody. They said it about the, the, tech, about the uh, Union troops from Indiana and from Kansas and from Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, the highest ranking general from Wisconsin during the Civil War that was killed was Colonel Hans Haig, and he was killed by the soldiers from the Texas Brigade. He unfortunately was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and he was actually shot and killed by one of the soldiers of the Hood's Texas Brigade. Don't know which one, but he was. 
All afternoon, Rebels and Yankees surged back and forth across the vineyard field in Lafayette Road. Until at 5.30 p.m., Colonel Luther Bradley's brigade of four Illinois regiments arrived to relieve the Federals, which proved too much for Robertson, who ordered the Texas Brigade back across Lafayette Road and into the shelter of the woods about 200 yards east. The brigade had suffered significant losses on the first day of the battle, some say as high as 25 to 35 percent. The night of September the 19th would be a cold and frosty night with no rations and no fires to keep warm. The Texans and Arkansans got what rest they could before the battle would resume on the 20th. On the morning of September the 20th, the brigade moved to their right, that's north, closer to the Brotherton House, and at 11 o'clock in the morning, they attacked across Lafayette Road, taking advantage of a hole in the Union line left when General William Rosecrans moved a division north. The brigade passed the Brotherton Farm and went about 800 yards before they turned north, all while under a constant bombardment by federal artillery. And it was the Hood's Tex or Robertson's Texas Brigade that actually went through the gap that was created by in the Union line. And that really helped the Confederates win the victory at Chickamauga. Steady fire stalled the brigade's advance. Jerome Robertson believed that the fire from their flanks was actually coming from Confederates who thought they were Federals, confused by the dark uniforms they'd been issued in August. Finally, the brigade fell back into the woods, where Hood would be wounded in the leg while he talked with Robertson about a counterattack. It was a very effective battle. However, the Rocket Chickamauga, George Thomas, was able to keep up from a complete rout. General Thomas's men were able to stall the Texans and the other Confederate unions to where there could be an effective retreat back to Chattanooga. If it wasn't for George Thomas, it would have been a complete and total Confederate victory. Having apparently shattered the Union Army with a bold stroke of luck, you know, the Union Army having made a mistake, created a gap, and the Hood's Texans poured right through it, Longstreet is adamant that it is time then to drive on to seize Chattanooga before Thomas or anybody else can rally the troops and hold that vital railroad junction on the Tennessee River. Bragg demurs. Bragg says, no, my army is in disarray. I do not know where the parts are. We have suffered heavy casualties. This infuriates Longstreet, who allegedly, and it appears in lots of sources, told someone close by that Bragg had an amazing ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And so Bragg's inherent caution, his focus on lines of support, his insistence upon clean, neat organization and communication, froze an already battered army in its tracks, allowing the Union Army time to regroup, get its breath back, and get a new commander in there named Ulysses S. Grant.